Thank you very much. Woo! Hi, everybody. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm so very excited about this, uh, this uh, panel discussion. If any of you were just in the luncheon with Mr. Milken, you heard him talk about the American dream. And that was a good appetizer for what we're going to talk about this afternoon. We're going to talk about those human stories and what is the American dream? How is it redefined today? And is it still attainable for many of the people who are not experiencing it? Also, we want uh, to talk about some action steps, what each of us can do to help one person at least achieve the American dream. And I think that we all have the power to do that. And we just have to figure out exactly what that is and make a commitment to uh, actually reaching out and helping someone. So I am very, very excited about this panel. We got a rock star panel. Here today, I'm going to start on my immediate left, not immediate left, my far left, my good friend, Mr. Will Packer, Emmy-nominated producer and founder of Will Packer Productions. Uh, hello, Will. Hey, Sean. How are you? What's happening? How you doing? Uh, Yasha Monk, author and lecturer, Harvard University. Yasha. And Mr. Rob Duggar, managing partner, Hanover Provident Capital, LLC, and a founder of Ready Nation. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. And on my far right, Mr. Jim Clifton, who is the chairman and CEO of Gallup. And right next to me is the wonderful Shireen Lauraz Salemnia. Yes, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, now, as a journalist, I am interested in human stories. So I asked people around the country in preparation for this panel discussion, are you living the American dream? People from all walks of life, I asked this question to. And here are some of the answers I got. Carla, a teacher in Atlanta, who is my stepsister, she said, I'm not rich. <coughs> but I have the basics. I have food, I have shelter, I have medical care, I have access to education. So yes, I am living the American dream. Malik, a plumber in Detroit, said, I have a criminal record. I have done my time, I'm working hard every day, but many companies won't hire me because of my past. So no, I am not living the American dream. Mario, an entrepreneur, said, I don't want to work for a company nine to five for 30 years like my parents. I want to call my own shots. My parents worry because I'm struggling. I'm not living the American dream yet, but I think I will. Vrej, an immigrant from Iran, says, my family and I made it to America. So yes, I am living the American dream. Angelica, who works for a healthcare firm, said, my company flew me to Malaysia to train workers there on how to do my job. I thought I was living the dream, but now I'm uncertain. Lauren, a single mother, says my, scun, my son's school is not the best. There's drugs, there's alcohol, there, there are gangs. I feel he's not learning anything that is going to prepare him for the future. I don't think he will ever live the American dream. James Truslow Adams coined the term American Dream in his 1931 book, The Epic of America. And he said the American Dream is a dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. Will. Yes. Are we living the American dream today? We collectively as a society, as a, uh, you know, I think that, look, it, it's, it's different every time in terms of every generation defines it for themselves. And I, um, I'm a filmmaker and I didn't like have any Hollywood roots or Hollywood connections. So I definitely feel like my life, my career has been a dream. Well, now I have kids. I've got a, a, um, 
a senior at Harvard. I've got two high school students. I've got a middle school student. So now, you know, for so long, the bar was like better than your parents, right? You have to transcend that previous generation. So I see the pressure that that my kids, the millennials, are under trying to like best what dad has done. My situation is is different because I'm a filmmaker, you know, movie producer, not a lot of those. But I think in general, this new generation is, um, I think of them as, as empowered yet vulnerable because they're, they're so empowered because, you know, technology has, has created great swaths of wealth um, for people that are younger than ever before in, in history. <clears throat> and there's this feeling that you can do anything. You can have what you want when you want it. And, and so that millennial generation, they, and, and I market a lot of my films to this generation, so I have to kind of understand the psyche and I have them at home. For them, they don't have this like set uh, path or route to success that a lot of us had, that I know I had. It was when I was growing up, it was like, well, what are you good at? What do you like? What do you want to do? Okay, well, this is the way that you go there, you do A, B, and C. They've rejected that, and we as a society don't put that pressure on them in the same way, which is good. Thus, they're empowered. But they're so vulnerable, and I see it in my own kids, because now there is this tremendous expectation that the world is your oyster, and you can do anything, and you, like, why haven't you created a billion dollar app? What are you waiting on? What's wrong, you know? Why are you not, like, the best of the millennials? Because that's the pressure now that is on them. And they don't have the same structure. So a lot of them, I find, are kind of floundering, kind of trying to figure out, you know, I, I kind of am good at a lot of things. I don't know exactly what it is that I want to do. I, yes, I can do anything. But what does that mean? How is that helpful? So I think that for this millennial generation, mm -hmm. they have yet to define like what success means. And I think they're, they're operating under like this imperative of like unrealistic <clears throat> success because right. of the times. There is asp aspirations under pressure. Sure. Yasha, let me ask you, um, how do we define the American dream today and how is that different than what our parents thought of as the American dream? No, I'm not sure that how people think of the American dream is that different. I think the access to the American dream has really suffered, right? So a lot of the American dream is having the basics and being secure in the basics. Not just that you have healthcare today, not just that you are somehow managing to go and get a decent education. It's that you know you're not going to suddenly be thrown off your healthcare mm -hmm. and have to worry about that and go into bankruptcy because of the co-pays and so on. It's that you know your kid is going to be able to go to a decent college. Um, but I think one important aspect also is the experience that people all through the history of America have had of doing a lot better than their parents. Often though it's because the parents were immigrants and they came from much poorer countries. Mm -hmm. And so they came to a world of, of plenty and where there wasn't repression and where the kind of um, social status they could achieve was much higher than where they came from. But often for the people who had already been in America, it was about doing a lot better than their parents did within the United States. From 1935 to 1960, the standard of living of the average American doubled. Mm -hmm. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled again. And since 1985, it's been flat. Mm. And that makes a huge difference because now, you know, 30 years ago, you could live the American dream and your neighbor could live the American dream and your other neighbor could live the American dream, right? You could all live the American dream together. And now what it means to live the American dream is to beat other people. It's to attain positional goods, right? So you live the American dream in a way that few people can because there's only ever going to be, you know, I don't know, 200 top Hollywood producers, right? And perhaps the movie industry is really well and there'll be 300 of them, right? But that's not going to work for everybody. Right? And it used to be that, you know, in 1950, most people were um, industrial workers who hadn't gone to college. Mm -hmm. And 30 years later, half of America had access to a college education um, and, and, and had grown up without a car and without a fridge. And now they had two cars and a fridge and a freezer to boot. And so they could all live the American dream. So I think what we have to think about is how those real structural changes in the economy and making it more difficult for people to achieve the same concept of the American dream, mm -hmm. and then what political impacts it's already having right. on what we're seeing 
in our elections and elections across Europe and other parts of the world. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and I remember uh, we were at the height of the, the auto industry. And I remember, you know, as a middle class, it wasn't uncommon for people on the street to have a boat or a second home, or everybody knew that their child was going to college. Obviously, with the collapse of the auto industry, Detroit's economy and the economy all over the world changed. Um, so, Rob, let me ask you, how should we be defining what the American dream is today? And you heard the stories at the begin, beginning that I talked about. People say they're just struggling. They're just trying to keep their head above water. And there are all these changes that are happening that they can't keep up with. Uh, I think that the um, most important thing to keep about this dream concept is that it's changed enormously. While the living standards may have gone flat, the fact is that people in 1985 didn't have a cell phone, did die of leukemia, could not travel freely in the world to the, to the degree they can now. So there's been a lot of uh, improvements in living standards which are not measured by income uh, or living standards in a, in a kind of traditional way. But opportunity is a, an important dimension of what is the American dream. And, and that's, for, it, as, as I look at it, that's kind of the core. Um, most of this American dream cons discussion takes place in the context of an idea <laughs> that there's a large part of the population which is very disappointed and angry about what's happened over the last uh, couple of decades with respect to opportunity. And in the last election, a brick was thrown by these people at people like us, the elites, to get them to pay more, to get us to pay more attention to them. Um, the facts are that you, when you look at this, you have to deal with basically two grim numbers. The first one is 60% and the other is 20%. 60% is the estimate of, no, of the number of 17 to 24 year olds who are likely to be able to get a mainstream job. You mentioned one who's a plumber. Right. This 60% number comes <laughs> from a Defense Department study repeated in 2009, 2014, which showed that 70% of 24, 17 to 24 year old Americans, men and women, could not qualify to be a United States Army private. Because they have records? They have police records, persistent drug dependencies, physical dis disabilities like obesity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they lack a high, or they lack a high school degree. These four characteristics disqualify 70% of all 17 to 24 year olds. So what this is saying is right. the, the pervasive reduction in, uh, or the pervasive absence of opportunity mm -hmm. for this very large population. When you, when you notice that at many mainstream businesses there are people behind the counter who are overweight, we say, well, it, it's not 70% for McDonald's. 60% is a better number. So this lower but nevertheless similar number, mainstream businesses are basically looking for the same kind of people that the military is. So many people are disqualified. Like I told you, yes. the, the, they have, yes, the gentleman. Yes, you gave the example. Right. Yeah, and, I, um, and, and, and he was saying that he, he's a plumber but could not get a plumber's license. That's exactly because right. Because... Uh, because of a felony on his record, he yes. says, "I paid my I paid my dues. I'm trying to make you know I'm trying mm -hmm. to make ends meet. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to make amends, but the system is still fighting against me and not allowing me to succeed based on the past." Oh, the, and the, and the and the numbers of people go on and on. Marissa in um, Broward County uh, in uh, in uh, a, a small town. I'm not going to identify it further than that. A small town in Ohio. Single mom, a son cannot get a job because what? She had an automobile accident. She is still not caught up on state payments to clear that up. Mm -hmm. So she is, in essence, in violation of Ohio laws and mm -hmm. finds it very difficult <clears throat> to get work. So we find these complications, particularly for single parents or double working parents, are very complicated. One tire blowout and you can't get to work can't get the child to childcare, I mean, suddenly life becomes very complicated and then opportunity just disintegrates. Right. Okay, I'm going to go over here to Jim. Jim, tell me what Gallup has found. You've been studying the issue of the American dream and how uh, many people feel that it is out of reach. What has your research shown? Well, <clears throat> let's see here. 
So, so the guy that started our company is a, a pretty famous American, George Gallup. He makes that hundred list of, uh, uh, not, not the Time Magazine one that has chefs and that kind of thing, but the one with Lincoln and, and, and all that. He was an academic that um, wasn't really trying to build a business. He just got real famous because he spent his whole life trying to figure out what the American dream was. He had a great quote where he said, if democracy is about the will of the people, somebody should go find out what that will is. <clears throat> he <clears throat> had a deeper mission. I'll, give a, I'll put a little foundation of the conversation we're having. What he was afraid of is that if leaders didn't know what was on the minds of the constituency, let's just call it the American people, and they were wrong about it, wrong about what they were dealing with. When you have your premise wrong, the more you lead, the worse you make things. And so he wanted to make sure that he was right about what the great American dream is. <clears throat> then he reported that. We can only go back 80, only 80 years. So we can't go back like the Civil War, pre-Civil War. But what the, Amer I'm gonna try to be very specific. What the will of the people or the great American dream was, was peace. So I'm a baby boomer. Uh, my parents, uh, of course, were greatest generation. We were the same, though. What we both wanted was we didn't, want a war, we didn't want to go to war. My dad did go to war. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. I just barely missed it. <clears throat> but very specifically, we wanted um, to have a family and own a home. And those are three that you can find very specifically in the, in, the, in, the, in the data. Peace, family, and have a home. If you have those, you're experiencing the great American dream. You're pretty much peaking out. But this, I've had the same job for 40 years. I've been CEO uh, for 27 or 28. The only reason I'm telling you that is you see so much data in my job, you can't believe it. I think this is the biggest shift I've ever seen in anything. But the American dream from me to the great isn't that much different but it just changed in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as interesting what the great American dream isn't because it is no longer peace. People aren't even thinking about it. Family's gone. And so is owning, owning a home. The great American dream comes down to this, having a good job. I want you to think about that for a second. Not having a job, but you gotta have a good job. And here's where the difference is. And I'm a perfect contrast group because I just wanted to find a woman I went to business school at the University of Nebraska. I wanted to have a job that paid $20,000 a year, a salary job. But my great American dream was in finding a woman, having three kids, and owning my house. That's what I was trying to do. So if you would have said to me, Jim, how are you changing the world in your job? I would have said, I don't think I am. Because I, I, don't know, I sell lug nuts or something like that. But you see what happens? So in the great American dream, where your mission and purpose and all that is with your family, you don't care about their job. Now it's changed. Now they care about their job, not their family. And that's why you have uh, birth rates in half. In my lifetime, women's birth rates in this country have gone in half, and it's because the great American dream changed. Marriages, people don't get, uh, it's delayed, it's delayed. It's unbelievable, 15 years during my lifetime, uh, birth rates went down. And then, or else you don't get married at all. So birth rates are the lowest they've ever been. Home ownership, Rob, you really know this, yeah. is the lowest it's ever been and it'll, it'll keep going down. But the shift is gigantic. I think, I'll just make one more remark. I feel like I'm talking too much, but. It means that when millennials come to the workplace, we have to manage them differently than old Jim. Because when old Jim came in, I wasn't asking if my job has meaning. I didn't need for it to. Because my family, I got that done too. I owned a home and I got all that stuff. But my meeting was there. And they said, Jim, is all you do is sell lug nuts or something? I go, I, 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 I don't care. Now it's just the opposite. When kids, kids, when millennials come in, what is that, 30, it's 38, it's getting to be pretty big. I think it's what, 60% of the workforce. What they're saying is, how do you take me? Is there something I can do in my job that's important? Is there some days where I'm kind of changing the, changing the world? Because if my job doesn't have meaning, my life doesn't have meaning. And do you think that's why, Jim, that as one of the, the people said in, in uh, the group that I interviewed, 
He said, I don't want a nine to five job and be there 30 years like my parent did, my, my parents did, because that didn't have meaning to them. That was just a that was just a job, but they want something that they're more engaged with. And becomes their I needed eight to five. I wanted to be out at five and <clears throat> well, I sound like I'm a hundred and fifty year old man. <laughs> but I am a good contrast group. But what young people want is they want it to be um, um, uh, their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my job is my life rather than my family being my life. So, but yes, when you talk to the ones that are really um, um, soaring, um, they, they'll say that they're you know, working all the time. Of course, one of the things you were talking about, about um, iPhones and all that, they actually, can't, they actually can be working uh, all the time. There's a number on this. There's 100 million full-time jobs. People want full-time jobs where they make between 45 and 85 thousand dollars, depending upon if you live in Kansas or if you live in New York or San, San Francisco. That's what you want. <clears throat> There's only 100 million good jobs in this country, and where we're actually delivering the great American dream in the workplace, only 30 percent of Americans report that. So that means this morning, only 30 Mar only 30 million Americans got up. Right. And, and, we're, and we're killing it with them. But it means you got 70 million where we're not delivering the American yeah. Okay, dream. let me get here to uh, Shireen. You said that you feel like you are living the American dream and you are also giving young girls that same opportunity, girls that have been left out or won't have a path to the American dream unless they are introduced to certain skills that they might not have known they had. Yeah, so I came here on a magic carpet ride when I was two from Iran. And when I was little, I was obsessed with gaming. I'm a gamer, I don't look like one, I know. But I was obsessed with gaming, Atari, Nintendo, all of it. And then I saw the movie Big and it changed my life. I was like, that's what I wanna do. And being Persian, it's like normally you have to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, no, 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 no. I wanna test toys. And the only place I can go was Mattel because that was like, I grew up in LA, so that was like in my backyard technically. And everyone was like, are you crazy? Is that a real job? That was my dream job. I wanted to test toys. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have that. So through luck and passion and perseverance and everything I guess that the American dream brings, I went through an informational interview, bugged my boss for nine months until he finally gave me a job. I went to the toy fair on my own. I was super gung-ho and like super driven. So I did that. I worked at Mattel on Barbie, dream come true, amazing. And then I heard about this doll called Bratz, and I was like, well, I need to go there. And so I started the research department and became the brand manager for Bratz. So literally, I got the corner office, I got the dream job, I got everything I ever wanted. But within two and a half years in, I started listening to parents come in and complain all the time. And I was like having a serious existential crisis, because I was like, I got the dream job, I got the corner office, I got everything I ever wanted, like you were talking about earlier, the whole dream, right? But then I was like, I have no meaning, I have no purpose, I hate going to work. When I talk about what I do, people are like, oh, that's bad. They're not positive role models, they're like negative. And so I'm actually write a, writing a book about my journey. It's uh, kind of like working title is um, Eat, Pray, Hustle right now. And because um, that's what entrepreneurs do. So. And I ran into Deepak yesterday, which was amazing, because he really changed my life. I told him. I ran up to him at an event. I didn't know he, who he was at the time. And I ran up and I said, I have a million dollar question. And he looked at me and he smiled. And I said, what do you do when you get your dream? Because I don't know what to do with myself. And he was like, you have to give back. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. I volunteer my time. I give money to charity. I do all that stuff. What are you talking about? He was like, no, 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 no. Trust me, you'll figure it out. I was like, can you tell me, give back to who, what, where? Like, <laughs> come on, another word, please. He was like, no, 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 trust me, you'll figure it out. So this led me on this journey of um, giving back and making a difference. And then I ran into Simon Sinek, and he wrote this book called Start With Why. And I asked him the same question. And he said, what's your purpose and why? And I was like, I thought I had a purpose. I thought I was testing toys and doing good for the world for kids. but. I mean, I think, and we talked about this too, like I think the media has a very strong influence on the American dream. Mm -hmm. And I had that, I had that from Tom Hanks in the movie Big. And I realized like I needed to create role models in gaming, in technology for girls, because going back to my roots again, I was a gamer, I was obsessed and I still am. So like finding my meaning and purpose meant the reinvention of the American dream for me. Right. 
And like now being an entrepreneur in the tech space and learning how to code, even though I learned how to code, here I went to LAUSD schools, nothing fancy, in the 80s. I had a female computer science teacher and we learned Fortran coding. And that's where I learned um, Apple IIc green screen computer, Carmen Sandiego. It was all ingrained in my head. I think if I didn't watch the movie Big, I probably would have been obsessed with that. But I had a different path going through big brands and one of them was my baby in a sense. I want to talk about the issue of education and opportunity because I think those are two of the things that lead people to living the American dream. Now Will, you majored in engineering. I did. Which every yeah. parent would probably want their child to do <laughs> today. <laughs> And what did you do with that engineering degree? Put it on the shelf. And just <laughs> tore it up and said, I'm going to be a film producer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Funny route to take to get to. But you know, it was an opportunity. What happened was I, um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I read that, well, you go to get an MBA, you know, if you want to be in business for yourself. And so I applied and was accepted into Wharton. But to your opportunity point, I was really, really good at math and science, and there was a big push, as there still is, um, for to increase the number of minorities in, in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, math. And I was a candidate, because I was so strong in math. I was like, but I don't want to do that. Like, <laughs> it's cool, keep the money, I would rather go to ward. And my parents were like, um, what did you just say? If you don't go and take that scholarship, so needless to say, I took the scholarship. And so I ended up majoring in electrical engineering. And then along the way, um, a buddy of mine, I was just telling the professor, he wanted to be a filmmaker. And he was influenced by seeing other people that looked like him. He was a young black male. And you know he looked at Spike Lee and the Hughes brothers and John Singleton. He said, I want to do that. And I said, well, I'll help you. And by helping him, I helped him to raise money and ultimately to self-distribute it and to cast it and later I learned that's what a producer does. So there were like opportunities and influences that affected my sphere and my perspective that allowed me to be where I was because I thought I was going on a very, very different path. And you know, it was the opportunities for me to go to an engineering school and then connect with somebody who was influenced by other people that looked like him to want to get in entertainment. I think that exact same thing. I mean, even here in the store, I think it's so cool you found like your passion from a movie, like in terms of the job that you wanted to have. I think that that doesn't happen enough now. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you have a generation that, you know, used to be a midlife crisis, like it's moved way up. You know what I mean? It's right. like a 20 yes. something crisis. Like, right. yeah, I had it what in my 20s. It I yeah. did. You did. I had yes. a serious midlife, or I know I call it existential crisis, but I seriously was like, I can't do this. What am I doing on this planet? Right. Like, and the messages were coming through. Right. Yeah. And Yasha, I see you nodding your head to what Will said. What was it that resonated well, with you? So I, I think we're in a deep, deep, deep bubble on this stage. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So yes. look. It's really? one thing to talk oh, about what it means for us to live the American dream. We all, in one way or another, have had a lot of luck in our lives, have had good educations, have had a lot yes. of opportunities. And so we can ask ourselves those deep questions of meaning and so on. Right. Right? That's true. I want to wake up in the morning and do something that I think is changing the world, is making it better, and so on. That is something to which most people don't have a luxury of aspiring in the current economy. What they primarily want to do is, yes, get a job. But that's because unless you get a job, you don't have decent health insurance. Mm -hmm. Unless you get a job, you don't get respect in the world. Unless you get a job, your kids are going to be struggling. right? And so we have to distinguish between what does it mean to live the American dream for a small set of people like us who don't worry about the basics. We, we, we can go back to being engineers. We can go back to testing toys, right? Um, and so we can start thinking about those highest aspirations of uh, what in the uh, hierarchy of needs by Mark Mazin is called um, sort of self-actualization. We can worry about the <coughs> highest part of a pyramid, which is around self-actualization. But what you're seeing in the wider population is that's not what drives most people. What drives most people is that they're worried about whether they're going to have enough food at home at night. Nobody is starving exactly, but are they going to have a decent meal? Are they going to be able to feed the kids what they think they should be eating? Are they going to be living in a neighborhood that is safe? Are they going to be going to a school in which they get decent instruction, for which you have to have 
the ride home because otherwise you're in a bad public school district and so on, right? So let's get back to that part of the conversation because it's well, all nice that's and well for us to sit Shireen around. about the opportunities that she is giving young disadvantaged girls who right. are underserved because I think that once again, like it, everybody here, if you could afford the registration fee, then you are living the American dream, okay? Um, <laughs> but for so many people, like we were talking about earlier, uh, like the woman I interviewed and said, my, my child goes to a school that, you know, there's more gang activity in that school and drugs in the school, and I'm just afraid that he's not going to come home alive from school. And so what do I do? I can't afford to move, but, acts, but, but education is going to be the key to him succeeding in life. So, Rob, tell us, you know, what has to happen? <laughs> Solve it, Rob. Uh, what has to happen? Well, what yeah. I did was this. I got, uh, I'm 72, and I'm a retired hedge fund partner. I was a partner for about 20 years. I was once uh, policy director of the American Bankers Association. So I'm an authentic, dark, secret mm -hmm. lobbyist at one <laughs> point. Okay. So what I did was with some other fellows, including Jim Heckman, the Nobel Prize winner that uh, 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 Milken uh, mentioned earlier, um, we formed a, something called the Invest in Kids Working Group. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at finding out what interventions actually generate real returns in terms of school readiness, re improved health, improved school performance, high school graduation, and ultimately college graduation. So the Invest in Kids Working Group, just to roll it into the present, became something called Ready Nation. Ready Nation is the largest business early childhood advocacy organization in the United States. There are about 2,000 business people who have been briefed, prepared, <coughs> and who are now uh, able and ready and do hundreds of times a year uh, speak to legislatures, governors, government officials, the public, TV shows like your own, um, the chief financial officer of an organization called Gallup is one of, our, one of our members and one of the people who uh, is ready at any time to write op-eds and, and, uh, and take a stance for what? Investing in parents and children from the earliest point in their life. Because what we know is what you do in those first five years, and actually prenatal months matter almost more. But what you do from conception to basically age five, six, or seven matters more than anything else. So we focused on that, and that's where, we've, where we have educational impact, but the educational impact is not so much writing and arithmetic in elementary school kind of thing. It's does a mom know how to deal with her challenges with a cracked, addicted boyfriend? Can she cope with that so she can take care of herself while her baby's um, developing inside her and keep her, uh, her own health and well-being such that the stress levels on that, on that developing child are such that it's going to be born reasonably healthy and uh, not cost the rest of us hundreds of thousands of dollars a week in neonatal intensive care costs, uh, say cocaine drug addiction and, uh, and withdrawal and the rest. So I, I think that you said the word bubble, and I think that's absolutely right. Conversations, and I, I love the Milken Institute, I believe 100% in what's attempting to be done here and what's been, been done for years. Um, but we heard a, a discussion yesterday, a very good panel, on populism in Europe. And it was talking about exactly the problems that we're talking about here. A large number of the portion of the population which feels like it is disadvantaged and being denied the opportunities that they believe society rightfully says it owes them. Uh, and in that conversation, the words children and parents and family did not, were not spoken once. Okay, that is a conversation which is taking place at a very high intellectual level. It is not actually willing and ready to get its hands dirty with what is actually going on about either the, the child of the, uh, the, of the woman you talk about or the people that you were talking about, um, people whose lives every day 
are under tremendous stress and even physical danger. So I think that um, if we want a society which is governable, and that's what we're really, the reason this is all being talked about so much this year at the Milken Institute Conference, governability. If we want a society that is governable, we've got to convince roughly 40 million people, 50 million people, that we are, understand what they said and that we now have received the message and we're going to do something about it and that we have adopted the priorities that are most important to them. And Jim, in my experience, for the sort of deer, deer hunting with Jesus cousins I've got in Virginia, the, the, you know, Be Virginia Be careful, I'm from Nebraska, so the you, Bible you, you, and gun uh, thing uh, are Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, okay. <laughs> For them, it's a job. And why is it a job? Because a job means you can take care of your kids and you can take care of your family. So what is it that really matters? It's family and kids. That's what matters. And if we're not talking about their families and their kids, we're having a discussion that is frankly going to just get worse because automation is going to continue to eliminate 10,000 jobs a month. And globalization is going to continue to uh, put continued pressure on compensation in the United States. So if, if, if we don't do, if we don't prepare our citizens to be able to, to function and be flexible, get new jobs, then, then, then we have failed. And right now, if it's the case that the, so to speak, next generation industry, the industry that actually raises young adults, mm -hmm. I mean, each one of us in various ways are involved in this work, this industry that produces young adults, as far as the military is concerned, it's operating at, se at, at only 30% <clears throat> efficiency. 70% of its products don't qualify. How many of you would get on an airplane if there was a 75% 70 probability <laughs> that it wasn't going to land? You wouldn't do it. So that's where we are as a society, and that's the conversation we need to be having. One of the, I, I want to get back to one of the points that we were talking about uh, earlier about this segment of the society that is unemployable. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the plumber in uh, Detroit, right. who happens to be my cousin. Mm -hmm. um, there, I have a, 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 another relative who lives in Detroit. Uh, he's actually uh, my, my younger brother, has a felony on his record. And when you go apply for a job, and you check that box, says felony, a lot of um, companies won't hire you. Now, when I say felony, what do you think the crime was? What is it? Marijuana. Marijuana? Who else? Mm -hmm. What? Selling drugs. Selling drugs. What else? Just give me, just throw something at me. Think of felony. Car right theft. There. Car theft. He has a felony for unpaid child support. That's, wow. mm -hmm. you can get him for unpaid child parking. Support. So that means he could be on the sofa <laughs> watching Judge Judy because he can't find a job and receiving food vouchers from the state while the mother of the child is working two or three jobs to care for the child. That doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. Can I say two things to that? Go ahead. Because the first thing is that that's obviously part of a really broken criminal justice system. Yes. Right? Uh, that is deeply unjust and, and disadvantaging people and, and that needs to be reformed and that can be reformed if we want to. Right. But I want to say something else as well, which is that it's a sign of a much deeper structural problem that we should be thinking about. Because you know what? If companies were desperate to find skilled labor, they would hire him. They would hire him despite his felony mm -hmm. for not having paid child support. Because they would look into the felony and they would say, you know what, this guy 10 years ago, he failed to pay child support. He's going to be a good employee. Mm -hmm. And we're desperate for a good employee. So let's give him a job anyway. So what this shows is not just that we have a failed criminal justice system, not just that we have to educate people and so on, but that it has a much deeper structural problem in our economy. In 1960, when we had full employment and people were desperate for good workers, even if they had had a criminal justice system like that, where he would have had a felony on his record, a company would have employed him anyway. Um, 
Shereen, you talked about the yeah. fact that um, it's important for young people to see themselves differently and to be able to um, not apply to themselves the types of dis the, the types of descriptions that society puts on them right criminal uh, uneducated right. not good enough right. whatever those labels right. are because that really affects um, their own self-esteem and what what things they go after in absolutely their life. They're, they're, the biggest thing I found in my previous life in the toy biz and just doing all the stuff with kids I'm a big kid as well is I, we've worked with inner city kids and whenever I ask them on the first day of Boys and Girls Academy, what do you want to be when you grow up? You guys want to take a guess? What did I get? Uh, Shout it out. Actress? Did I hear that? No. Model? No. Mm -hmm. no. Athlete, music? No. <laughs> I was shocked. I'm still, my head spins every time I hear this. It makes me get chills. P.O. Do you guys know what a P.O. is? <laughs> I don't. I thought it was a police officer. I said, wait, you guys want to be a police officer? Like, no probation officer. Oh. And I heard this from eight-year-old girls, mm -hmm. African-American, 16-year-old boys, Latino. I was like, I, I was like, I took a step back. I was like, I know we're in South Central. I went to the librarian because I've been doing a lot of stuff through the mayor's office and different places. And I said, what's going on here? This is 2015, 16, 17. Why am I hearing this? And she goes, well, unfortunately, they're being told you can be in charge or go to jail. Those are their options, right? They don't know. So I went back the next day and I said, hey guys, we're going to SpaceX. Who wants to come? And they were like, what's that? Like, they could care less, right? And I was like, do you guys know? We also take them to Google. We give them opportunities. We literally plant the seeds in their brains to see there is awareness, right? So I said, do you guys know who Elon Musk is? No. I'm like, do you guys know the Tesla car? I heard a couple of yeses. I took a step further back and I said, hey, have you guys seen the movie Iron Man? They're like, yeah! They all got excited, boys, yeah. girls, all ages, right? And I was like, do you guys know Elon Musk is the real Iron Man? And they're like, what? And I said, yeah, there's an Iron Man suit at SpaceX headquarters, plus they filmed Iron Man 2 there. All of a sudden they were like, we want to go, right? right? Because it's the media again. <laughs> giving them that influence, right? right? So I went from PO to you can be like Elon Musk at SpaceX. Even the girls were like, wow, that's really cool. And the boys were like, I was like, you guys, do you know how much money you can make at Google as a coder? They were like $500, $1,000, no clue. I was like, you guys can make $90,000 to start plus free gym, meditation, you know, all that stuff. And that's what we do in our programs too. It's healthy, balanced lifestyle stuff. Because I think coding is a big part of it. It's a big chunk. And those are the biggest jobs. There was a number that went around for a while by the year 2020, 1 1.4 million jobs available in the tech space, right? And there's so many opportunities, but they don't have the awareness. And that's the problem. They need to get this like literally plugged in their mind. And how do you think they, we do that? How do you think? Well, I mean, I've been doing it on the ground, yeah. literally, but I feel like I'm one person. Like there needs to be a tribe and a village to really make the shift. Mm -hmm. But that's why I keep harping on the media because society and culture says one thing, right? They're getting, oh, because you live in South Central, you should be okay with being a PO. That's their like top level job, technically. But then I also hear, oh, I want to be like Michael Jordan. I'm like, that's awesome. Do you know who that is? Do you, did you even watch him play? Does he play basketball now? No, I like his shoes. I was like, that's great. But you know what? Like, there's so many other superstars that we're not talking about that are in the industry, tech industry, whatever right. that is, right? Yes. Uh, they told me that I can open the floor up to questions, and so we want to do that. Uh, but before we do, Jim, we've talked about, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, education. We talked about, um, you know, retraining people for different types of jobs. We've talked about, um, you know, changing policies. <coughs> what, what area concerns you the most? And what do you think that we collectively and individually can do to make changes so that more people can, can achieve the American dream? Um, <clears throat> my, my, my theory is that if, if you take GDP and do it per capita over the last 20 years, you know, you hear that the, that the economy is recovering. 
That's clinically and technically not true. Mm -hmm. The economy's, it, it's, I don't know why the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they just don't tell the truth. They keep saying it's, re, it's not recovering. If you do linear regression with GDP per capita over 20 years, if I had a slide, it would look just like this. <clears throat> and so what you see is the stress that's put on a society. We've never had this before. Full-time jobs is what a good job is. This was going somewhere, I'll try to do it fast. <clears throat> So we have the lowest percent of full-time jobs ever. So you see, we're not delivering. But then what we do is because we're so optimistic, Americans are. So we just added 10 million jobs. Isn't that great? 94% of them are part-time or temporary, you see? But so what you see is the stress of a society that's someplace they've never been before. But there's all, this is so... Um, depressing, but I'm going to say it anyway. <clears throat> what, what's happening is that we're taking away, we're snatching um, the American dream out of people faster than we're giving it. And so yeah. what you have is you have a crashing of lives that we've never had in America before because the middle class, I have a brother-in-law out in western Nebraska, probably I'm, I guarantee he's got a Bible and a gun. <laughs> but, and so he worked at a dog food factory, maybe he was making 50000 You are so good to go in western Nebraska at 50,000. The dog food, I don't know what happened to it, but it left. Now he goes down to 8,000, but he's had the, or to $8 an hour, but he's had the great American dream totally snatched away from him. And so Gallup has checked this. There's uh, 250 million adults <clears throat> in America, but we ask if they, if, if either them or their spouse or somebody in their household had that. It's between 10 to 25 million Americans yes. have had the great American dream snatched right out of them and especially white males. The number's 10 to 25 million. You, you can get, here's one you can get from that. I got two words for you, Donald Trump. Rightly or wrongly, what happened is, we have a question where we say, just trust me, it's a real good question, but it's, it's real, what it really says is, how you doing? How's your life going? And we ask that every night to America and all that. Let's do Asians, Hispanics, blacks, and whites. Who do you think has the most optimism? When you say, how's America working for you? Which one says, I'm killing it of those four groups. African Americans. What's that? Not, not African Americans. Hispanic. Asians and African Americans. Yeah. The African Americans are doing are doing pretty darn well, but Asian, the, the whites are. Well, last. African Americans uh, are answering that question <laughs> and saying that our perception <clears throat> of how America is doing. Whatever I, the reason. This, no, but I'm just because you said they're doing pretty darn well. I was just saying, like, your whole <laughs> point of that was their own perceived mm -hmm. reality yeah. of their group in society. That's all. Yeah, not okay. doing well, but, but uh, Asians probably are. Asians make America work better than any other group. <clears throat> Hispanics, second. But the one that's really low is white Americans. But that's what it's like when it's snatched away. Okay, I want to say one other thing. The solution, though, is we've got to turn economic energy around, or this will never, I mean, all the wonderful things that you're doing, my CFO's doing, I'm doing a bunch of stuff like that, too. Yeah. It, it will not fix it. I shouldn't be on this panel. Until, <laughs> it will not fix it until we reverse economic energy. Until GDP per capita starts going back the other way, so we've been averaging about 1.7. It, you know, 3% 3 is a miracle. The biggest time of human development ever is between 1850 and 1950. You say, well, how fast did we grow? The whole world changed, and Americans changed between 1850 and 19. We grew more then than thousands of years before. GDP goes at 3.75. You see, you don't need to get up to 8 or 10, but until we get there. Here's what's happened. Millennials, although they're really good workers, they don't start companies. We've missed a whole generation of birth rates of new companies. I think we, what, we, what we need is a whole bunch of Shireens. But, but the, the, these, are like finding unico these are like finding a needle in a haystack now. So somehow, I don't, know if, I don't think we can fix that generation. We probably have to go to the, G, the Z generation and figure out how we can have a whole new institution of startups or it, I don't think we're gonna get another chance. Can, can I prove that I shouldn't be on this go panel ahead. either? It'll take me 20 seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we really need to distinguish between the way in which you live the American dream by achieving, you know, the one in a million amazing position, by becoming a basketball player or the sort of slightly lower down versions of being basketball players that all of us in the States enjoy, right? And thinking systematically about how we can re-deliver the American dream to a majority of the American population. And coding jobs are not going to be it. Anybody... Yeah who anybody in this room has personally hired or interviewed, 
that's not going to be it. A huge majority of the jobs in this country come from small businesses doing tasks for which you don't need a college degree, right? And so it's great that there's going to be 1.5 million coding jobs in America in 20 years, and we need to make sure that we train people for those because they can deliver some economic growth and all of that. But how many Americans are there? 300 million. You're so right. 1.5 right. million coding jobs is a tiny, tiny portion of what we need to do True. if we want the average American to feel like the promise that this country has given them is delivered on and to make sure that they're not going to be so angry that they smash up the political and the economic system yes. in an even more radical way than we've seen a few months ago. You're right, but it's not just coding. I think it's digital media, there's like social media, all these jobs that didn't exist, right? Like YouTube, there's so many potential opportunities that are available that these kids don't know about, right? They can be on YouTube, but they, do they know what happens on the back end? They're doing it all day long, right? So there's, there's so many opportunities that these kids need to know about, and they're not aware. So we need to get out there and give it to them. We need to literally give them the awareness and the tools to make it happen for them. I agree with you. I think there's no limits. There isn't. If we and really literally, get, that's what it comes down to. If you get they're intentional getting about it, boxes. I think there's no limits. But we're right. not well, the, intentional And, and you have, we have to expose them, right? The limits <clears throat> are you, you, you aspire to what you know. Right. Right? So, you know, Shireen's working with kids in and, and, and those communities. You know, the most powerful, empowered person, you know, is the PO, right? So we have to, the, the limit is on their ability to access. This whole thing was about the dream. Right? A dream. Well, that's your individual personal aspiration, like the highest high, the fantasy. Well, look, everybody's is different. And so if you've got whole communities, and, and my, my point was like everything's relative, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to your point you were making earlier. If I, if I give you $10, that's good unless you're respecting 100, right? Yeah. If you're mm -hmm. respecting nothing, that's pretty good $10. So right. it's relative to the groups right. that you're asking. Now, right, exactly. Point. Like my sister, my sister, my stepsister said, I've got the basics and I'm happy where I am. There are other people who feel like I want to be one of the top tech billionaires in the world. But also, like Yasha was saying, some folks are just, they just, they, they just need to be able to eat. Right. They need to be able to eat and feed, you know, feed their families, have shelter, have access to education, uh, and you know, a host of, of other, other things that people, you know, other, many other people take for granted. Do we have any questions before we wrap up this, uh, this gentleman here? I have one observation, then a question at the end will be quick. I think you need to define what you mean by American dream. I mean, what you guys say is that America has problems, but that's not, I think, what the expression American dream means. First, there's the word American there. <laughs> so it's, it has to be put in international context. So the American dream is the amazing ability that this society has to absorb immigrants. And then because institutions are strong, those people can, if they work hard, get to some level of life quality that they cannot get in their home country. So that is how I understand the American dream. What the American dream is not is about equality. It never was. When Ra Rock Hudson was making love to Doris Day you know, on TV, a bunch of African Americans couldn't find a decent job. Women, the most the max they could aim for was to be secretaries. So this idea that the world now in the United States is worse than the world 50 years ago, I don't know. Ask African Americans in the South if the world now is worse than before. So what I hear here is saying that there is a particular group of the society that is suffering from competition, from true competition. These are the white males from the Rust Belt. So what we need to think is how we give them opportunities, of course, which means retraining, to be used to being a true American dream that treat everybody more equal than in the 50s, than in the 40s, certainly in the 1800s. So that's what the American dream is, and that's still pretty much alive. So my question for you is that, what would be your life if you lived in Ghana? What would be your life if you had stayed in Iran? So that's what the American dream is. And I, I would like to hear what's your preferred country, how your life would be. Nasha, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, so a couple of things. Uh, it's not about equality. 
right? I don't think that part of the American dream is yeah, that I don't want somebody to have a lot more money than me, but I want to have a decent life, right? It's not, the people aren't angry just because other people have a lot more than them. They're angry because so much of the economic growth of the last 20 years has gone just with their riches in the society that they are struggling to have a decent life. And in that sense, so, so I think there's two ways. You, know, you talk about the American dream versus other forms of dream, right? I think on the economic dimension, that is exactly the same problem in Europe. I'm, I'm guessing that you may be French. Perhaps I'm wrong about that. No, I'm Brazilian. Oh, I see. So, sorry about that. Um, but when you look at elections in Europe, you also see the rise of populists who have exactly the same problem, that in the post-war era in Europe, you've had incredibly rapid economic growth, and people felt engaged in their democracy, not just because they like the idea of equality between citizens and all of those kinds of things, because they said, my system is delivering for me. I'm a lot better off than my parents were. And now they no longer have that, and they want to blow up the system in Europe too, right? So in that sense, the American dream is, was never about America. It was about the fact that the United States was better at delivering this dream than lots of other countries in various parts of our history. It's not that people in France or Germany or Brazil had such different aspirations. But there is one thing that's specifically American. I want to speak to that for, for, for a short moment. Um, uh, I became a US citizen about a month ago. And one of the reasons why I was excited to become a US citizen is that having grown up in Europe, I know that those are countries in which being a member of a society is still deeply defined by coming from the same ethnic and religious group as the majority in the population. And we are trying to figure out how to be a multi-ethnic society and a multi-ethnic society that gives real equality to all of the people who are living here. And obviously, it's not as though the United States hasn't had, let's say, you know, some challenges in that in its history. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you can become an American and you're equal to everybody else is still more deeply ingrained here than, than in other places. And, and I became a US citizen because I'm more hopeful that we can make a genuinely equal multi-ethnic democracy work here than anywhere else. But to do that, we need to do two things. We need to make sure that we hold on to a common idea of American identity. And that's something that's under challenge, both from the far right and in some ways from the far left. But we also have to make sure that we give people the material comfort they need in order to not be jealous of other ethnic and religious groups. When you have rapid economic growth, it's easy to look at somebody over there and say, well, he's not from my group, and he's doing well, but I'm doing great too. So I'm fine with that. I'm happy with that. If you're in a society where you feel it's zero sum, and I'm really struggling, and why is that guy over there doing well? you get a lot more anger, and that's going to destroy not just the material American dream, but also the dream of American society, but we actually can come from all over the world and see each other as equal citizens. The, the, I know where I said The ahead. subtext, and, and this gentleman alluded to it, and, and I get exactly where you're coming from. The subtext of this whole conversation that we all kind of touched on, and we did, you know, it's a different panel probably, but even when you just say the American dream, right? Now more than ever, it has been proven to us as Americans, whose America are we talking about? It has been proven to us that now, many of us don't live in the America that we thought we lived in before November, right? And there are other people that are saying, you're damn right, this is our America. So I think that the, the subtext of it is how it's being defined by the groups that are still claiming and holding on and aspiring to American ideals. And I thought you did a very good job in terms of breaking down kind of where we are today. It's ever evolving and changing for some of the very same reasons that, that, that Jim is talking about on the end and the factors that are affecting all of us. So I think that we didn't, it was in the subtext of this conversation, but we kind of never like really addressed, you know, like whose America are we talking about? Like, let's break it down if we're going to say that American dream. That definitely is another you panel. Know, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do we have one like 10 second question? Go ahead, General. You, yes, you, sir. Oh, absolutely. Yes, the decline in mobility. And I was just saying, we're using the word social mobility, 
Yeah. Uh, ha has social mobility declined in the United States, basically, right? Yeah, oh, you have a microphone. What effect is having? And, and we have a lot of data from a lot of sources mm -hmm. that indicate that over time, the ability of lower income people to get to higher income levels or get higher than the levels higher than their parents did. As a matter of fact, it says the odds of a child born to parents in the bottom one fifth of the mm -hmm. economic distribution to rise to the top fifth in the U.S. is 7.5%. Yes, and it used to be much higher. So that's obviously uh, a key uh, factor here. But I think that uh, what we've, in the last few comments, we've really begun to focus in on what this is all about. And the, the American dream has in it not only sort of social mobility, but a sense that uh, as an American, I'm getting a fair break. And I think the, 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 the reality of uh, robots costing $8 an hour and the average employee costing $25 an hour in a world in which average employee costs are probably going to go up and average robot costs are probably going to go down, the effects of automation on work is going to get more and more serious. So we have to have answers uh, for how we enable people to, to have the flexibility to, to preserve employment critically, critically important. This is a societal challenge. Mm -hmm. And in fact, given the, the numbers that Jim was talking about, this is almost an existential challenge for the United States. In other words, it's not exactly clear <coughs> that we have the tools to uh, address white male or not white male or whomever, just this very large percentage of people who uh, just for reasons of personal background and, and health and, and, and drug dependencies and so forth, can't get a mainstream job. That problem gets worse rather than get better. So we, we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. okay. Jim, we haven't heard from you in a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just your final thoughts on this topic. I, I had already checked out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had gone what into my it? own little world. You have gone in your and own I, world? Yeah, and then he was kind of <clears throat> <laughs> No, I think it's very fixable. Um, but, but I think that I, I agree so much with what, what Shereen, Sh what Shereen said. We young people have to start businesses or this country d doesn't have economic energy. Kids will. We, we've got we to totally disrupt higher education. I hope nobody's in here. Higher ed hates me for saying this. It doesn't work. It's not serving the people right. You go on a four-year vacation, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> you know, the kids that are starting these companies, they don't make it through college, the Google boys and, and, and Gates and, and, and everybody else. But we don't have early identification techniques. We can find um, h um, high IQ kids. We're masters at intellectual development in this country. You have a thousand kids, we know who the smart ones are, who the slow ones are, and all that kind of thing. What we need to know now are which one of them has this unusual grit where the, the mess of a day of starting a business is actually what they want. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we can identify, we show through our own analytics, we show it's five in a thousand. Uh, point about immigrants, there are four, uh, women are the same, blacks are the same, Hispanics, everybody's the same. Poor people, rich people. God was very egalitarian, hanging, holding that, um, giving that one out. <laughs> but as soon as we figure out who those are, have early identification like we do in, in sports. I mean, my God, if anybody's a running back or a three-point shooter or some kind of, but, a, but early identification for those kids, and then put them in very special development. Every city ought to have their own Juilliard for these exceptional kids. Remember, I'm not talking about IQ, I'm talking about grit. God put different batteries in certain kids, and she, here's one right here. <laughs> but we need to get them, in, in, uh, and, and Rob, we gotta, get them, we gotta get them funded, we gotta yes, get mentors, right. and just yeah, really work right. like crazy. But as soon as America puts her attention to this, like we did World War II, or like we did development of technology, mm -hmm. I think we can turn it all around, and this is very American to say, the world works better when we dominate it, econo I should say lead, when we lead it economically. I'm well, glad that's that's really ahead. interesting that you say that because I also teach at USC and I teach uh -huh. at the engineering school tech for social impact. So I'm giving these kids tools to start social impact companies. That's say so there you go, there you go. And Jim, I'm glad you ended on that point because a girlfriend of mine who has a, a son uh, who has not been able to find a job told him, you're going to have to start your own business. 
you're going to have to create your own opportunities. And we need role models to guide children through those waters because a lot of them might not have that. They just need somebody to touch their lives and to tell them what to do and to be a mentor and to be there for advice or whatever they need. Uh, as they navigate, once again, navigate those waters. So thank you. I, I, we could talk another hour on this probably, but thank you so much. I appreciate all, right. all of you being here. Thank, thank you. Thanks for coming out.